All right, we'll just give it another mi a minute or so, people. We're still getting uh, participants uh, coming in, so uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I'll start by uh, introducing myself, just to let everybody know uh, who I am. My name's uh, Alan Boyd. I'm uh, the director for uh, Northern and Eastern Ontario with the calls V3AJB and uh, V3Echo Mike. Um, as director, I've been asked to moderate this session with uh, Kelly here this afternoon, and we welcome everyone here. I think you're going to find it very interesting. In the opening remarks uh, from our president, Glenn McDonald, he was mentioning, how do we get youth engaged in amateur radio? And this presentation is going to blow your socks off, believe me. Uh, Kelly uh, is an educator that has worked with youth and uh, giving ideas. So she has an excellent uh, video presentation. And afterwards, uh, certainly if we have time, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So with that, uh, I think we're doing very well. You've got uh, 45 participants in here, Kelly. So uh, mm -hmm. it's quite full and I'm sure there'll be uh, more coming in. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly to introduce herself. And then when she gives me the cue, we'll bring up the video. Over to you, Kelly. Okay, well, thanks for joining me, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be able to present about my program today. Um, so I'm Kelly Stoman and my call sign is VE3KLX. And I teach computer programming, uh, mathematics and physics at West Fair Secondary School in North Bay, Ontario. So today's presentation is about my high altitude balloon program. Basically how it came to be, um, the amazing adventures I've had with the kids um, as well as information on other high altitude uh, balloon programs around the country. And also some general information on um, basically like the technical aspects and logistics and stuff of participating in this activity, especially at, in a school type setting or uh, with youth in general. So I also like Alan, I've heard quite a bit today about how uh, to get young people involved in radio, we're really having to lean in towards computer science. And I'm kind of a case in point for that because really when I first got into radio in 2017, I had never planned on being a ham operator, um, but I was just really trying to do something I had seen on YouTube. So, um, and it was the Raspberry Pis that dragged me into this in the first place. So that's, uh, that is the entry, I guess, for some of, uh, some of us these days, so. Um, so what we're going to have now is just a, a video presentation I made because they say that I talk too much and I didn't want to go outside of the time confines. So I recorded uh, what is basically a slideshow with videos intermixed uh, as a presentation about my program and high altitude ballooning in schools. So Alan, if you don't mind sharing the video because I don't have broadband where I live. So yeah, not a problem, Kelly. Here Excellent. we go. All right. Okay, I'll bring this up and we'll start the video. Let's go here and play. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Goodbye. <laughs> and so began my adventures with radio in the classroom. Before that, I was a computer science teacher working at Whittefield Secondary School in North Bay, Ontario, where I taught computer programming and electronics. I'm always looking for new things to do with the kids, and we had been working on electronics with uh, Raspberry Pi mini computers. We had acquired a set of Pi cameras, so I was surfing the net looking for an interesting idea to share with the kids when I came across this intriguing video. It showed a couple of girls around the same age as my students, and they had attached a Hello Kitty doll to a helium balloon and sent it, apparently to space, with a camera capturing the entire flight. I had no idea how they had accomplished this amazing feat, but I knew instantly I was hooked. I researched all night, and the next morning I was in my principal's office, talking way too fast and asking for money. I got together with a math teacher named Lori Howe, and we started a club called the Whittefield Near Space Program. It was a collection of kids from different grades and with different skill sets. 
I explained to the kids what we were going to try to do and also that we didn't know how to do it yet. So that's how we got started. It didn't take long for us to figure out that radio tracking was essential and that uh, the amateur radio and APRS was the way to go. I contacted the North Bay Amateur Radio Club and found a group of like-minded individuals ready and willing to help us with our project. I started studying and had a basic license and my very own call sign by March Brick. At that same time, we were buying equipment. Our first purchase was a pie in the sky board. It was from England where APRS cannot be transmitted from an unmanned aircraft. They use a 434 megahertz signal to send their telemetry. So we also got the uh, APRS add-on board since we were in North America and not subject to that same restriction. For the sake of redundancy, we also purchased a Bionics MicroTrack 1000, which was a one watt APRS transmitter designed to work at altitudes over 18,000 meters. Finally, we purchased a spot trace device to get the final ground location of the payload because we learned that the APRS transmissions wouldn't be heard if the payload was lying on the ground or behind an obstruction. We set to work constructing the payload. The container was a styrofoam bait bucket with a layered set of components. It turned out that this was a terrible design, making it very difficult to adjust components or replace batteries. Nonetheless, we had the payload ready to go by the end of April, when most of the snow was gone from the bush and the ice was melted off the lakes. We were using flight path prediction software provided by the HAB Hub organization to identify where conditions seem good for a flight. We live in a region called the Near North, about three hours north of Toronto. It is dotted by lakes and wetlands and bordered on the north by Barrens and to the east by the Algonquin Provincial Park, an area with few roads, spotty self-service and very sparse radio reception for our APRS beacons. Picking a day with the right upper atmospheric currents is do or die for a mission here. Once the day is identified, we notify the stakeholders about 72 hours in advance and then file a notice to airmen. After schooling the retrieval party on radio etiquette, we are as ready as we were going to be for the big day. This is all our teacher's idea. Like they've been doing these like high altitude ballooning, like sending things into space, like around the world kind of, it's like starting to be a trend. So she wanted to do it and she's the one that got us all involved. You seem pretty excited about it this morning. Tell me why. Yeah, well like just we've been waiting for this day for so long and like have, like, we've had things ready and we've just been like, waiting for this day to come and yeah it's exciting. Do you understand why they're sending the balloon up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, because it's cool. <laughs> like our group goal was just to come together and put like a project that Whitfield hasn't done before and like our goal was just to learn more about like space and the like the stuff behind it. First of all to learn a lot about sort of the weather and radio technology and the computer engineering side of it and also to get the video footage and the images that we're going to get when we retrieve this payload. So there's video footage on it. So right now it's filming its entire voyage. So that's really what we're looking at besides the live transmission of images. So if we get our computer set up, we'll be decoding images right from space as this is happening. So we're back to the 434 megahertz signal that is being transmitted by our pie in the sky board. It's sending telemetry every 60 seconds, but in between those bursts, it's transmitting image data, mind you, at a scorching 300 bode. We had hoped to capture these images during the chase, but try as we might, we were unable to locate the signal. Perhaps, since we were almost directly under the antenna, we are in a uh, signal blind spot, so we heard nothing. Despite this minor failing on the ground, our balloon was up there behaving exactly as predicted bursting at an altitude just over 33,000 meters and descending under parachute to a location within a couple kilometers of the predicted site. Our convoy of teachers, students, and radio amateurs got as close as we could to the payload by road before heading into the bush for a short hike of about 500 meters. It took us about half an hour of scouting about before one of the students spotted our bright orange payload hanging from a tree a couple of feet off the ground. It was a truly beautiful day except for the black flies. We're going autofocus with all the hands moving. <laughs> That's oh just amazing. We had big plans for another launch. We were going to try to make a rotating antenna that adjusted according to data from queries made to APRS.5. But they announced that my school was going to close, so I packed up my bag of tricks and moved to one of the other high schools in my school board. 
At West Ferris Secondary School, I was assigned the grade 11 physics course, and I brought this high-flying activity into the course, focusing on concepts from Newtonian mechanics and EM waves to align with the curriculum. This time, we used a worm flap for the payload container. The flat, single-layer design gave us easy access to the components. The kids did their best to arrange the heavier components near the outside of the box to reduce angular momentum so that there would be less, video, uh, less spinning in our videos. One of the physics students had some experience with Python code, and so he took charge of writing and testing the code for each of the three cameras on board. We were ready for launch by Thanksgiving, but it wasn't until the end of October that we found a day with a favorable prediction. It was the first snowfall of the season when we trudged out onto the football field for the launch. This wasn't the best conditions to capture video from the flight, but with days growing ever shorter, we decided it was a go. The snowfall wasn't the only thing going wrong that day. I think that we didn't set the zero correctly on the spring scale we used to measure lift. We overinflated the balloon a lot. I knew we had screwed up when I watched it sway and undulate as, as it moved off into the sky. And ruining the video wasn't the only repercussion of this overinflation. The balloon burst at only 28,000 meters, leaving much of the balloon material still attached. With this increased mass, the descent was faster, and so our payload landed way short of the prediction in the untamed woodlands of Algonquin Park. It's not that we didn't know where the payload was. The spot trace reported its longitude and latitude to three decimal places. It's just that where it was was the middle of nowhere. It was a full day's journey by canoe and foot into the location. I went in with the outdoor ed teacher but we failed to find it despite having the coordinates. The bush was really dense. Winter was on the horizon, and with the hours of daylight shrinking, I was losing faith that we would ever see our payload again. The next weekend, five days after the launch, one of the students went into the location with his dad and their dog. They found the payload completely intact, hanging from a tree. We had used an audio beacon on this payload, a loud beeping alarm that was still going out, off after almost a week in the cold, wet bush. This was one lesson learned from the first launch, when we found out how difficult it was to spot a bright orange payload in the bush. For the most part, the equipment was fine, but the bionics tracker had suffered fatal water damage and had to be replaced. As predicted, the recovered payload video was terrible. It made me motion sick. And the images from near space showed mostly fluffy clouds. But mistakes are for learning. So we are now a little wiser. So it was time for redemption when we got to work on the next mission in the spring of 2019. Again, this project was part of a course and my team was the grade 12 physics class. I came up with the idea for the moonshot mission over the Christmas holidays. Since I had been born in July of 1969, I was keenly aware of the approaching 50th anniversary of the moon landing. I had seen high altitude balloon missions where a toy had been videoed on a journey to near space, such as a Lego spaceman. I wanted to send up a little moon landing scene to commemorate the anniversary for both NASA and myself. I sketched out my idea for the kids and they agreed. But the goals of the moonshot mission went far beyond sending a couple of toys to near space. This was our most complex payload yet. It carried a suite of sensors programmed to record the temperature and pressure as well as compass heading to monitor the amount of spin. And we are also conducting an experiment with solar panels to determine whether solar power produced enough energy to be used on subsequent missions, as well as which position was most effective, the top or the side of the payload box. This time the launch was a beautiful sunny day in the middle of May. Members of my local radio club joined us on field for moral support and to confirm that our APRS beacons were transmitting correctly. We were very careful to ensure that our scale was correctly zeroed so that the lift capacity of the balloon would result in an ascent rate between four and five meters per second. We had filed a notice to airmen for the flight, but as usual, we also called the airport from the launch field to get the final okay before we released the balloon. After the launch, our chase convoy headed south. We monitor the balloon's progress on HabHub flight software, which imports APRS data upon request. 
It provides the current location and updates the path prediction in real time. North Bay is located on Lake Nipissing, which is a relatively large body of water, and so we were relieved to see that the balloon had cleared the lake and would land further south. Payload landed near the town of Blossom in a wooded area about 500 meters from a side road. We figured that the payload was hanging from a tree because it was still transmitting APRS beacons. We hiked through the bush, listening for the audio beacon to guide us. It wasn't long before we located the payload and got headed back to school to check things out. We checked the SD cards that were used in the Raspberry Pis and found that we had a full set of data from all sensors on board. And as far as our little astronaut, there he was riding on top of the box at 33,000 meters above Earth. In preparation for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, NASA had set up a website where the general public could submit stories about the new moon landing. And so we submitted our story there along with some images of our astronaut at 33,000 meters. Then about a week before the anniversary, I received an email from NASA telling me that our moonshot mission had been included in an article on their website. Later that summer, there was another email from NASA. This one inviting me to go to Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland to make a presentation about our project. NASA's facility in Maryland houses the largest collection of scientists and engineers in the US. While much of the grounds are off limits to the general public, the visitor center is designed to greet tourists and student groups. The center displays space artifacts inside the education center and outside in Goddard's Rocket Garden. The event I attended was called Observe the Moon which is an annual event held around the world with the goal of promoting space and planetary science education. The center was busy, filled with educational displays, discussion groups, a robotics demo, teams of students that had designed their own rockets, and later in the night, telescope viewing. For my part, I was thrilled to be introduced by Charles Bolden, an astronaut on four shuttle missions and Chief Administrator of NASA under Barack Obama. General Bolden was a very friendly man with an obvious enthusiasm for the next generation of explorers. All in all, despite some technical difficulties, my presentation seemed to be very well received. We got the shot. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so we pulled it off. We got the shot just like we wanted. and. Um, yeah, I, I have heard a few people say that the fact that the flag is fully deployed despite the limited atmosphere could suggest that this was staged in a studio. <laughs> Which, you know, the studies are doing with people like that. So the kids and I knew what happened. And, and for me, this was a very elaborate birthday party to myself. So, so, Okay, so, <laughs> what does the future hold for my little near space program? Well, um, most of the kids that did that moonshot mission with me have graduated and they're off at university. So I actually had an email from one of them the other day. He's studying uh, um, space engineering, aerospace engineering. And he told me he's working on a sounding rocket this year. So that's cool because he always wanted to blow stuff up. He was unhappy with our feelings. <laughs> but, uh, back at school, um, we've decided the grade 11 physics class that we're going to set our mission goals as soon as I return from my trip to NASA. So they think that's pretty cool. And um, the other thing is, is we're waiting on a contact from an astronaut from the International Space Station. So over the summer, I put in a proposal uh, to the ARIS program. So that's amateur radio on the International Space Station. And um, I asked for a telebridge contact so, because we don't have the radio satellite receiver technology at our school to pull it off. So we, they've accepted our proposal and we're in the queue. We're just waiting to be notified of the date. So that's also exciting. But this is an incredible activity. And I just do, do want to give a shout out to the organizations that provide the resources and tools and support that allow us to do this. So this couldn't be done without the Global Space Balloon Challenge. Um, the Hab Hub organization, um, local radio amateur clubs, and then a legacy of childhood dreams inspired by NASA. So 
that's my whole story. Thanks very much. After the presentation, one of the people who approached me was a NASA scientist named Dr. Ben Poulter. He was an environmental scientist who worked at monitoring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere using spectroscopic instruments installed on satellites, namely OCO2, which is a standalone satellite, and OCO3, which is a measurement device installed on the International Space Station. OCO2 measures every day the same time of day. With OCO3 on the space station, we're going to sample from sunlight to sundown. And so now we can learn about carbon cycle through different parts of the day. And that's really important because plants respond to sun. So we need to see them behaving across the day. Our team designed and built an agile mechanical actuator that allows OCO3 to look at dozens of areas on the globe each day. And each of these areas is about 50 miles by 50 miles in size. So that allows us to actually focus in on specific areas, maybe urban areas, as well as agricultural regions. This capability of OCO3 to map out some of those areas and start to see some change over time, that really is how we are going to advance our understanding and our modeling for the future and understanding of climate. Dr. Poulter just approached me and um, suggested this idea of doing simultaneous measurements um, of, from our balloon of CO2 and their satellite of CO2. The thing is, the way that NASA measures CO2 concentration with light waves means that they measure the total CO2 in an atmospheric column. Then they use a computer model to generate values for the specific concentration of CO2 at each altitude range. But NASA does not have devices at each altitude range to get an actual measurement that would allow them to check their model. So that is where we come in. The plan was to attach CO2 sensors to our payload so that there would be actual data set to check against NASA's model. And we are also checking just the basic feasibility of such an effort. Could relatively low priced non-dispersive infrared sensors be used to sample local atmospheric composition at upper altitudes? To give our mission context, so to really give it that value um, of why it's important in the in society in general that our mission just isn't about students learning, but it's also about NASA learning whether their model's accurate. Dr. Poulter also connected us to the people at NASA's JPL who coordinate the operation of OCO3 on the International Space Station. They have entered the coordinates of our school into their database so that on the day of the launch, the pointing mechanism of the OCO3 device will be directed at us. So it was back to the drawing board with a new group of kids. The grade 11 physics class was charged with completing the physical tasks, designing and building the payload, researching and purchasing sensors, arranging the components, and assembling the flight train. By the end of January, we had completed these tasks. The payload was to be handed off to the computer programming students in the second semester. They would create the software and test the systems before the launch. Already, like the calibration part, we just need to get the main code in. The payload was even more complex than the previous moonshot payload. We had concerns about the overall mass of the payload, and so the decision was made to send only one APRS tracker, the Bionics MT-1000. We also sent the spot trace for ground recovery, as well as the audio beacons that had been so helpful in the past. We included two Raspberry Pis wearing Grove Pi sensor hats, which allowed us to easily connect multiple sensors and a Pi camera to each device. We came to understand that there was an issue with sensor calibration. The sensors are calibrated at Earth's surface with pressure of about a thousand millibars. In an NDIR sensor, the concentration of gas is determined by the amount of IR waves absor absorbed by uh, molecules in the gas. This meant that in the low pressure environment of the upper atmosphere, our measurements would be incorrect. Additionally, the pressure and temperature would be out of the sensor's operating range for any altitude over about 6K. To try to combat this, we purchased an SCD30 CO2 sensor that supports dynamic calibration. However, during a balloon flight, the pressure is changing so rapidly that the dynamic calibration may not work under these conditions. We also attached a Sensair S8 CO2 sensor to see how it performed as the conditions became more harsh. We devised a second strategy in our efforts to overcome the low pressure calibration issue. 
we constructed a pressure chamber and inside it we put two CO2 sensors, an SCD30 and an S8 uh, sensor. And we also put a temperature pressure sensor. The plan was to use an air pump to create a sample inside the chamber at 1000 millibars. Once the sample was measured, a solenoid valve was opened to evacuate the old sample. Since we didn't have a vacuum chamber for testing, we don't know if this will work. We think that at some point the atmosphere will be so sparse that no sample will be possible. So, th so the plan was to do something in the programming to handle this case. When semester two began, the programmers took over. Dr. Uh, Poulter helped me kick things off by conducting a Skype presentation on carbon dioxide, climate change, and NASA's efforts to monitor the situation. This event extended well beyond our class with all senior science students and kids from the Enriched STEAM program in attendance. After the presentation, students were able to ask questions. It really generated a lot of excitement for our project and for the pursuit of science in general. So there's this big climate change problem. You don't really know how big it really is, right? And I think this, this whole presentation put it into perspective. It's very exciting for me because um, it's something that I never thought I would be doing. That was February 2020. And then the whole world shut down. Thankfully, I had all of the equipment with me. I had brought the payload home for the March break, intending to do some testing. The plan was for the kids to write all of the code for the sensors as soon as we returned from the break. But we never did return. I touched base with Dr. Poulter at NASA to update him on our circumstance with the school closure. He was not surprised as things were going much the same in the U.S. Despite the closure, I wanted to keep the kids engaged in the mission. To this end, Dr. Poulter connected us with NASA's Balloon Program Office at Wallops Flight Center in Virginia. NASA had a long history of high altitude balloons. In fact, balloons provided a platform for much of the uh, experimentation in the early days of the space program. Currently, the facility is used to launch science experiments and long duration balloons that are as large as a football stadium. One of NASA's balloon engineers named Chris Yotter, call sign KM4NBX, was kind enough to provide a technical consultation on our payload. We identified a potential issue with the pump overheating at extreme altitude. At first, this seemed counterintuitive since the upper atmosphere is a very cold environment. However, a hot component can only be air cooled if there are air molecules that the thermal energy can be transferred to. In the low pressure of the stratosphere, overheating is a legitimate concern. A decision was made to add a temperature sensor to the payload that would monitor the air pump for overheating and shut it down if necessary. The kids also completed the coding for the mission via remote development. I created Python libraries that simulated the sensors so that the kids could write and test their code at home. Still, with everything now in working order, we are once again on hold as we head into a new school year bounded by health protocols that continue to threaten our launch, if still in place by spring. But my program is not the only show in town by far. There are many schools around the world running high altitude balloon programs and several in Canada. When I first started researching this activity, I discovered a group out of Shaftesbury High School in Winnipeg that had an amazing program. There was a teacher there named Rob Streamer, call sign Victor Echo for Sierra Hotel Sierra. He started working with students in 2010 through a group he called the Shaftesbury High Altitude uh, Robotics Project. In 2015, the Manitoba Association of Physics Teachers expanded the program to include multiple schools in the province. The idea was for group members to support each other as teachers in schools and to bring students together to share experiences and techniques through an annual symposium. The group has had as many as 15 schools fly in one year. In 2015, they began doing group launches where uh, groups of students from different schools uh, from grades 6 to 12 would gather at a launch site at a host school with upwards of 12 schools participating. Uh, this event had a carnival atmosphere with staff and students from the host school watching and host the planets playing on the PA system, underscoring the enormity of the event. With each year, students in the program improved their payload design and construction. Many staff and students became certified radio amateurs through the process with certification courses running out of Shaftesbury High School for a while. In addition to this, the roof of Shatsbury High School was the site of a certified Aris Telebridge station. And although the station is removed now, 
Shaftesbury continues to participate in the ARIS program, most recently making contact with astronaut David St. Jock in April of 2019. They also pulled off a launch this spring despite the pandemic. In Manitoba, schools began the process of phased reopening in June. The grade eight team from Avery Middle School had completed most of their payload before the closure in March and were eager, eager to uh, launch their flight before graduating off to high school. Teacher Andrew Hildebrand made it happen on June 10th. The launch was a little different due to health protocols. Each student was driven to the launch site by a parent and family vehicle. Many parents took the day off work to spend the day with their child, engaged in a multidisciplinary outdoor adventure. So that is some of the ways that you can use radio in the classroom to promote risk taking and a growth mindset in students. For me, it has been an exciting learning curve that recharged my enthusiasm for each day of work. I've tried delivering this high altitude learning in different formats as a school club, as part of a physics course, and as part of a programming course. Stratospheric ballooning has a wide scope that allows it to be adapted to different subjects in science and technology by selecting mission goals and student tasks consistent with each course curriculum. This activity can also be adapted to different age groups. Elementary classes and Boy Scout troops are excellent candidates for such adventures. In each case, it is important to know the students you are working with so that you can decide which tasks the students can complete on their own and which tasks teachers need to support. It is the process of problem solving that is the hallmark of high altitude ballooning, rather than a focus in any one subject area. This activity can also be modified to fit a restricted budget. For example, the CAMSAT uh, events require students to build a payload the size of a pop camp. A smaller payload can use a smaller, cheaper balloon and much less gas. The use of hydrogen instead of helium can also be a major cost savings. However, the ghost of the Hindenburg still looms large, so in my experience, school administrators are too nervous to take advantage of the cheaper gas. The tasks involved in organizing a near space program are many, and they require a diverse set of 21st century skills. This is a team activity, and so it is best led by a team of educators able to model a collaborative work ethic. The delegation of tasks is an important factor in the success of the mission. The first task is to secure funding. A near space program cannot get off the ground without the generous support of an administrator or sponsors, especially in the first year when equipment costs are high and the evidence of success is not yet present. It is also important that the administrators understand the flexibility of schedule required by an activity so heavily dependent on atmospheric conditions and so unpredictable in terms of its outcome. The next requirement to check off is a radio license. Radio is the only way to track locations at altitude, and in North America, APRS provides the most ready solution. This means that at least one member of the group needs to have a radio license. However, if there is no licensed teacher, a school group could work with their local amateur radio club to assist with the tracking and provide a call sign. With the money and license in hand, it is time to gather the student team and organize its members according to their strengths and interests. There are two main categories of tasks that must be accomplished, technical and logistical. Technical aspects will involve payload and flight train design and construction, and the purchase and testing of technology. Logistical tasks involve the budget, transportation, publicity, permission forms, and communication with government agencies, such as the airport and NAV Canada. Before any tech is purchased or the payload is designed, it is important to clarify the mission goals. For an inaugural mission, simply launching the balloon and getting the payload back can define success. But decisions do need to be made about what kind of images and video are desired, whether there will be sensors and what type, and the type of tracking equipment that will be used. These are not simple decisions. You must take into account not only the cost, but also the mass of each item and the technical background of the team. It is probably best to keep the mass of the payload under 1,000 grams for a first-time mission. Now it's time to select and purchase the equipment that will meet the mission goals. This could include tracking equipment, antennas, cameras, other electronics, and batteries. The team can now design and build the payload container. The design must take into account what materials to use, such as styrofoam, tape, podgy, the size, mass, and orientation of the technology, so, you know, does the device need to be upright? Do you need access to power ports or camera ports? Um, orientation of cameras and antennas 
on the outside of the package. Um, a design also must balance the masses to minimize the spinning during the flight. Um, you've got to think about how the cameras and uh, antennas will actually be mounted and attached to the payload. And then finally, how the container will be attached to the parachute. After the payload has been designed and the total mass has been determined, you can now purchase the parachute and balloon. You must also consider the flight train. What type of cord will you use to attach everything together? You may want to consider a swivel attachment so that spinning does not cause your flight train to become tangled. There are online tools that can help you determine the size of balloon and parachute required for your payload. Once the tech has been installed into the payload container, it must be tested to make sure tracking and reception equipment works, to make sure all required ports are accessible, to see if all cameras function, and to make sure the camera shots are clear of unwanted obstacles. It's a good idea to develop a test protocol or checklist that will guide you through your actions on the launch day to make sure that you are not forgetting any essential tasks on the day of the actual launch. Selecting a launch date and location can be a complex decision that could change based on conditions in the upper atmosphere. Since this information is based on forecasting, it is not possible for us in our region to plan a, a flight any more than a week ahead. The unpredictable nature of this task can make it a very stressful part of the mission that requires the understanding of all parties involved, including students and administrators. Ultimately, no launch date is confirmed until the go no go meeting, which we have 48 hours ahead of the launch. There's excellent software to assist you with flight path prediction and the selection of your launch date location. Um, and you can find links to this type of software um, through the Global Balloon Space Challenge or the Hab Hub organization's website. Well, selecting a, an exact date might not be possible, then um, in that case, what you should do is select a launch window, a range of dates wherein the launch is possible. This sets a date point at which all mission requirements must be ready to go. The exact date of the launch is then chosen based on flight path predictions with consideration for other activities that may be happening at the school and the availability of your community support, such as the radio club members that will be supporting your in-flight tracking. Another way to handle the unpredictable nature of this activity is to have more than one potential launch site. Of course, the ultimate launch site is your own school grounds, but this may not always be possible. For example, in North Bay, where I live, the prevailing conditions generally send the flight to the east. And so we had an alternate launch site west of the city where we could use uh, in the event that there seemed to be no day that would allow a launch from our primary site at the school. Because high altitude balloons uh, travel through controlled airspace, you must notify the authorities of your flight. So there's a few different places to contact. Um, first of all, you do have to file a notice to airmen within 48 hours of your flight um, to warn any pilots and airports that um, there's going to be a balloon in the area. Um, you must also, in our case, we contact the shift manager of the Toronto Area Control Centre for NAV Canada. Um, and then we also contact uh, the local airport just to let them know that we're going to be flying. And then we contact them the day of the flight at the moment we're going to launch, um, just to make sure that um, there's no air traffic in the area they want us to wait for. As with all flight preparations, checklists are the call of the day. And whether this is a listing of all required equipment to bring to the launch site or a list of items that each student should bring uh, on the retrieval or an ordered list of tasks to accomplish um, all of that needs to be accomplished on launch day, it's very important to have these things in order. Um, the launch day will be a busy and stressful event. And so planning and rehearsal is essential for a smooth mission. On the launch day, all roles must be finalized, each task assigned, and the launch checklist must be vetted through a simulated practice to identify any missing steps or important considerations. After your balloon is released, the chase is on. Generally, the tracking team is a group of cars carrying a variety of participants, students, teachers, uh, volunteers from the radio club, and other interested parties. Um, on this field trip, the destination is unpredictable and will most likely involve travel through rural areas on dirt roads. And so um, you have to work out how you're gonna transport the kids because a uh, yellow school bus is probably not the best uh, fit for this kind of thing. In the past, we tend to use um, just rental vans or teacher owned and teacher driven cars. 
Um, so this is a high risk activity. So I know at our school, we have to submit an emergency plan to get administrative uh, approval. Um, but the plan in our cases, it's kind of hard to submit. They're open-ended because you kind of don't know where you're going and you don't really know when you're going to get back either. And you're not entirely sure the details of what's going to occur while you're there. So um, luckily we've, we've ha experienced a lot of flexibility with our administrators and understanding that um, we can't um, declare a lot of this stuff in advance of the journey. Perhaps all that seems like a lot, but it is totally worth it. This is authentic problem solving at its best. Students learn that the key is that they set their sights and maintain a heading which can carry them to their goal. With an understanding that the time to destination, the path to destination, and in some cases, the destination itself can all change. Okay, that's it. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Okay. Well, that is tremendous. Uh, wow, what a what an experiment and what a wonderful thing to do with the kids uh, there, Kelly. That's the first time that I had the opportunity to see the whole video in uh, in uh, completion there, and uh, that's tremendous. I'm sure we're going to have a whole uh, thing of questions here. So let me uh, just bring that up, and uh, we'll go through and see what we've got. Uh, Good comments. That was awesome, Kelly. Amazing job from Margaret, uh, the A3 VXN. Um, okay, what else have we got here? Uh, that was awesome, Kelly. Yeah, uh, excellent work, Kelly. Uh, John, the A3 uh, MSV. Uh, Mike, uh, V3 IPC. Hello, and very comprehensive uh, presentation. Well done. Uh, just going through. After the video, okay. Okay, so that's good. So we'll open it up. Is there anybody else uh, for any questions for Kelly or anything that uh, would like? Uh, we've got quite a crew in here. We've got over 55 people, Kelly. So wow. it's, uh, it's great. I've been trying to keep up with the Q&A here, so. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't see it when I was uh, showing the video because of uh, my uh, thing here, but uh, anyway. But it's a, I'd be happy to work with anybody on stuff like this and uh, give them technical advice and everything. And I, I also do have a website where um, I post a whole little, uh, it was like a teacher workshop I gave on how to start a near space program. Um, so I'd be happy to do that. I have a hard time finding someone around here to work with me. I think they think I'm crazy. Or a little bit, <laughs> but um, so I've been I've been trying at my new school to get someone to join in with me, but uh, no luck so far. We'll see what this year brings if we can even go. So. Okay. okay. Any uh, others that uh, have any questions uh, for Kelly and? I'm sure, is there uh, contact information for you, Kelly, that you can share with uh, anyone, um, email address, or if people have further questions or further follow-up? Sure. So, I mean, um, where should I post it? Um, post it in Q&A to everyone, or how does that work? Um, that's a good question. We're going to have to check. I'm sure we're going to be on the... Uh, uh, you know, the RAC website with all our presenters and that. So I'm sure it'll be there afterwards. Of course, people will be able to watch this video uh, on YouTube uh, after uh, after this conference. Uh, I know we were talking on uh, uh, from the director's standpoint on allowing it to be able to uh, be viewed for the next X amount of days or uh, weeks. So, um, so, so I'm sure there'll be places to post it. Uh, where right now, I, I can't answer that. Because I do have a website um, that's showman.x10host.com. And the 10 is just the number like 10, x10host.com. So that's, uh, and the, um, and that's 
the other, uh, my email address is kelly.showman at nearnorthschools.ca. And near north schools is all one word. Okay, and schools is plural. So um, I guess that'll help maybe, but we'll, I'll post it as soon as you guys have a place to post it all. I'll make sure I get it up there somewhere. Because I'd love to collaborate with other people on this and maybe we could send a bunch of sensors up and give Nat NASA a bunch of data um, to assist them in uh, verifying their model. So I think that that would be incredible if we could uh, get more teams involved and get more data points on the map for uh, Dr. Poulter. Excellent. Just a couple of other comments. I wish I had a science teacher like Kelly. That was from Doug uh, V7EPT. Uh, uh, Brent uh, VY2HF, absolutely wonderful. Your students are very lucky to have you in that. So yes, absolutely. I mean, getting youth engaged is the key. Certainly on behalf of Radio Amateurs of Canada, we thank you so much, Kelly, for doing something like this. This is exactly what our uh, president and uh, executive uh, directors are looking at. We want to get youth engaged in the hobby, continue this, and uh, what an excellent uh, project to get the youth involved. And uh, hopefully, maybe we'll get some future amateurs, not only scientists, but yeah. amateurs out of them too. You know, it's, uh, it's wonderful and uh, very exciting uh, to see uh, it going on. So uh, do you have... Um, a future launch date uh, or is there everything's on hold right now for that last payload or I always think I'm trying to go before the uh, Jap Japan Olympics I don't know <laughs> <laughs> there you, go. So, you know uh, I, I would really like to go in the spring I can't like it's not going to happen before the spring it just can't but I would love it if it could um, and we'll see. I mean, they pulled it off in, El in uh, Manitoba so maybe with enough protocols if we had some sort of solution for the transportation. I mean, you just got to make the string a little longer and we can all maintain our six feet. So oh, yeah. we'll see, fingers crossed. I well, I'm sure if uh, you know your existing students or any future students that are going to get involved in that, they're, they're certainly going to be uh, enthralled with that. that it's just absolutely amazing and to see all that and get the recognition from NASA and the doctor. Oh yeah. That. That's, uh, that's really high accolades uh, for sure indeed so that was great that was that was fantastic really you know <laughs> and it was my 50th birthday so it was kind of like oh wow. <laughs> well exactly you know so, good. I mean, it's uh, it was uh, it's it's wonderful to get acknowledged that way and what you're doing and putting uh, Corbeil and uh, you know northern Ontario on the map that's uh, wonderful too and you know, I certainly speak as director for Northern Ontario. Uh, uh, certainly any future thing that you want rack involved or whatever, I'll back you 100%. And uh, uh, because this is exactly what we're doing. And certainly uh, we'd like to hear future information follow up so we can put it in the Canadian Amateur Magazine and uh, follow up with that uh, for sure. So. so you guys have been really supportive, really, right from when I first called you know, the guy on the website for the North Bay Club, right on Alan Griffin has been fantastic um, through, uh, cause I've had a couple articles in the TCA. So right. I mean, I've had nothing but support from uh, radio amateurs of Canada and uh, really appreciate, you know, the whole community and everything. Well, and just to let you know too, uh, radio amateurs of Canada support bursary awards too. So if you know of a student that was yours that uh, did an exceptional job uh, by putting their name forward, uh, uh, we have funds, uh, you know, that uh, are available for these type of students and, and that. So please let us know and uh, if we can help their further education and, uh, and that to become scientists or whatever their future in, uh, in uh, science and technology, uh, that's what it's all about. So for sure. Great. All right, one last call, people. I see it's just about time. Uh, we've got a minute and a half left. Um, are there any final questions or anything further for uh, Kelly uh, this afternoon uh, to join us? We'll, uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, as soon as this presentation is finished for those, okay. 
Okay, so uh, from uh, Marcel, at the end of this session, we are going back to the main meeting room uh, for uh, discussion and then the AGM uh, and that. So wonderful. Terrific uh, project, Kelly. Thank you. Great uh, oh, presentation, thanks. Kelly. Thank you. A job well done. Uh, can you include it on the RAC website? Uh, Alan Griffin has info. Okay. And uh, all of that. So mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, attending uh, Kelly's presentation here. We're going to ask you all now to uh, go back to the main meeting room if you're available. We're going to have open discussion there for a bit. And then, of course, the RAC annual general meeting will be started. So with that, I'm going to close this session and we'll see you all over there. So thanks again, Kelly, on behalf of RAC. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you.